This morning we're going to be looking at what Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 7. And it has to do with what God is willing to do in all this. And here are these promises. And it starts like this, Matthew 7 beginning in verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. These are promises. These are assurances. He is saying He will do His part. He will say that He is saying that He will supply as as you ask. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him it will be open. Here's the assurance. He's, he, actually, it's a reiteration. This is, this is the assurance that he gives to everyone. Verse 9. Now we have a comparison. All right, if you know how to give good gifts, your Heavenly Father knows how to give good gifts too. He knows how to do it. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? All right, not likely. Not likely that that's going to happen. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. I'm sorry. Yeah, serpent. But it's not not likely. Verse 11. If you then, being evil... Okay, you're not as good as God. (laughs) You're You're not as good as He is at all. Yeah, you fall short of the glory of God. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? That is a very good statement and a very good comparison in all of this. Now, we want to look at just a few points involved in this. Some things that we need to know. And the first one is that this is offered to all people. This is offered to everybody. It's not just a select few. This is given to everyone because those that were there weren't just His disciples. We'll see that in a second. There is a lot of people there. And it is an assurance to all. Matter of fact, let's go to, to Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, because this is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, of which Matthew chapter 7 continues the Sermon on the Mount, and it ends at the end of chapter 7. All right, so this is, this is the setup. This is the, the, uh, the, uh, the event or the, uh, what was occurring. This are, these are the people who were there who heard this. And here we have... In verse 1, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... Taught who? He taught the multitudes and his disciples. All right, this isn't just for his disciples. This is for everybody. Now, it would be very strange if this whole message concerning the Sermon on the Mount was just for the disciples because everybody else heard it Everybody else responded to it at the end of of chapter 7, verse 28. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astounded at His teaching, for He taught them as one having authority and not as one of the scribes. Okay, they heard it, and He's speaking to them too. So this is for all people. Suppose, just suppose that... Some of the most wicked men were standing there hearing this. Would this whole promise of ask, seek, knock, you'll receive. Do you think that applied to them too? That it was offered to them too? And the answer would be yes. It was for them as well. Here are these two groups. Then, And we go to, to Acts chapter 17. Paul speaking to the Athenians. Now, those are Gentiles. And he's speaking specifically to two groups, the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers. All right? These are two schools of philosophy that were in Athens of the day. And he speaks to them. And there's, there's no disciples that are there. There's just Paul and then all these that are listening to him. And look at what he says. He says, and he has made, that's God, from one blood every nation of men. 
All right, so we can know that from Genesis chapter 1. We can know that that is in fact the case. That we're all, as stated in, in our class, we're all one family. That's what we are. We have spread out all over the world precisely because that's what we were supposed to do. And God had to bring that about in Genesis chapter 11, make sure that it was done. And we weren't all just sticking around in one big city, spread out by languages, but still from one blood, every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. So we have spread out over the continents, over the islands, all in the mountains, in the deserts, in the cold, in the, in the, on the equator, all these various places, on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they might do something. So that they might seek, they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. Now he's telling that to the Athenians. And actually he's speaking this concerning the history of humanity. That wasn't just limited to the Athenians. That God has always been close by. If you want to find Him, you can now, you're not going to see him physically. You're not going to be able to see him with your own eyes. But you can know he exists. You can know it and you can find him. If you grope for him, if you are looking for him, you will, in fact, find him. And the problem is, the problem is that a lot of people, when they find him, they don't like what they found. That's not what they were looking for. They were hoping for someone different. That's the way it was concerning, like the, concerning the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees and the Herodians and, and others that, that opposed Christ. They did not like Him. They didn't like what He taught. Now, they liked the miracles. They did like that. But they didn't like what He taught. They wanted Him to be teaching something else other than the Word of God. They wanted their own doctrine being, being uh, spun by Him. But here we have that God is not very far from us. He's always been here. He's, and, and He can, in fact, be found. In Isaiah 55 and verse 6, Seek, seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Okay, so Isaiah is saying the same thing, but here is a plea. Call on Him. Look for Him. Find Him while you have the time. Because there's a time limit on this. There's a time limit. You don't know how long you got. Some folks will die today that they woke up having no idea this was their last day. Now there'll be others that will be pretty certain this is their last day because of certain things happening in their life. But there'll be people today that will have no idea this is their last day. They will be at different ages. You don't know how long you have. And I remember being in middle school. I was just in junior high. And one of the boys in junior high, I knew him, died. He died in the hospital. And that took a shockwave through all of us because we saw ourselves as being immune to such things. That, yeah, that happens to such pe some people, but not to us. That happens to old people, but not to us. No, it happens to everybody. Everybody at some point. Point. There is time, a time limit in this, and time will run out. Time will run out. And there's not a thing you can do about it except do things in a timely manner. Do things while you have the time. Do things while you know to do it. And so here is seek the Lord while He may be found. Call on Him while He is near. Do that. Do that while you can. Now, the second point we want to make in all this is that this requires an effort from you. 
This, require, this is not where you just lay about in luxury and God supplies you everything that you need. He has supplied everything you need, but this requires something out of you. Christianity is not a place for the apathetic. What's apathy mean? It means you don't care. It means that uh, you, you have better things to do, that there, there are other, other matters that are more important than following God, than following Christ. That's not Christianity. Christianity is not something that is a matter of just put you in luxury and there you are. Christianity is not a place where you can just set it aside and and think that it's always going to be there for you, that Christ is always going to be there for you. This takes dedication, and it takes effort on your part. We'll ask this question again. We've asked it before. What does it mean to be religious, do something religiously? What does that mean to do something? We say that so, so-and-so uh, goes to baseball games religiously. What did we just say? Well, one, it's, it's not a, a good news for that person. But it means they're always at a baseball game or they're always watching baseball. They always are. They're doing it religiously means that that is their life. That's what they do. What does it mean to serve God religiously? That means to obey God is what that means. That means he is first in your life. But this does require an effort from you. You are the one to ask. You are the one to seek. You are the one to knock. You must do it. You must do it. And if you're not going to do it, well, then it won't be supplied. If you're not looking for Him, then okay, you're not you're doing nothing. You're doing nothing at all. And these are all imperatives. When it's, you have ask, and it'll be given to you, well, that's an imperative, meaning you ask, without putting the word you in it. That's an English thing. You ask. You are the one that are supposed to be doing this, not someone else. You are the one. You are the one that's to have something inside you that wants to know, that is, in fact, seeking God. Something must be inside you of where you are doing this, and it requires something from you. We go to Isaiah 43 and verse 22. But you have not called upon me, O Jacob, and you have been weary of me, O Israel. And this, of course, coming from the Isaiah, it's God speaking to all of the Jews, all of them. That you haven't sought me. You care nothing about me. You've become weary of me, and I mean nothing to you. Now, the news coming from Isaiah toward them is not good. That is just not good. And the idea of sending Isaiah to them and the book of Isaiah to them is in the hopes that they wake up. But what's it going to take for them to wake up? What's it going to take for them to actually care? What's it going to take for them to actually call on Him? What's it going to take? There is the easy way of where someone like Isaiah brings you the message and you change. Or there's the difficult way where there is punishment involved and then you have the opportunity to realize the mistake that you made and return to Him. Or there is the way that has no return. The way that has no return. That's the extremely difficult path. That's the one where the individual does not learn. The individual refuses to return to God and they die in their sins. And that's that. Someone who will not regard God at all, regardless of what is occurring in their life, regardless of the things that they know they've done in their life, they just, because of arrogance, because of foolishness, because of whatever, they will not acknowledge God. They won't do it. And yeah, there were those in 
of Jacob and of Israel that they refused to do that. They, they refused. And yes, they will be punished eternally for that. They will be punished. And it's not going to be easy. We'll just take a moment to talk about that. When God, you think God has no imagination? How did you come to that conclusion if you think He doesn't? Look at all the, the life that is around this world. The variety of just, just birds. We just take birds, never, never mind sea life. And never mind all the other things. Just birds. And all the different just there's extraordinary creativity just found there there's extraordinary we can take it out into space <coughs> there's extraordinary creativity that is found in space and power to make all of it power to make all of it god who has that kind of power god who has that kind of creativity and God, who's also just, you think He doesn't know how to punish? That somehow it's not going to be much of a punishment at all when He says it will be? It will be. It will be extraordinarily harsh. Matthew chapter 23, Jesus addressing Jerusalem. Verse, 20, uh, verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Notice, Jerusalem has to be willing. God is not going to just put protection over Jerusalem and them being unwilling of it, that they don't care anything about it. They have to be willing. It's a choice on their part, and God supplies. God, Jesus says, He's talking about a history here. History between God and Jerusalem. And yes, He is regarding Himself as who He is, God. He is part of the Godhead. How often I wanted. He wanted to do this, but they were unwilling. Well, if they're unwilling, then it they're not asking, they're not seeking, they're not knocking. And guess what? It's not going to be given. It's not going to be answered. It's not going to be provided. It's not at all. Something has to be done on their part. It must be. Now, we come to this point. Do not, well, we're talking about asking. Don't ask amiss. All right? Don't ask amiss. Don't ask for, don't think that somehow God is going to give you anything that you ask for because He's not going to do that. It's going to be everything inside His will. Because I can, my imagination is pretty big in asking. All right. I can ask some pretty big things. And then as I see, you know, and and it can can grow from there. It can grow incredibly from there. But... We're not to to ask amiss means to ask in something that that should not be supplied, to ask for something wrong, to ask for something that that would in fact take uh, be be something that is astray, something that that shouldn't be done. And we come to this, James 4 and 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Okay, that's asking amiss. Now, God, Jesus says, ask and it will be given. But there's always going to be stipulations around it. He's not going to give you any, just everything that you ask for. Now, I've used this illustration before, and I'll use it again. Suppose I ask God for, just going to randomly, for Paris. I want the city of Paris. Is he going to give it to me? Well, there's a lot of things to consider with that request. Do the people of Paris not have a say in this? that maybe they don't want their city belonging to that guy living over in Georgia. Maybe they don't want that. Do do they get no say in this whatsoever? And what am I going to do with it anyway? All right, now, what happens if you ask, you, you you, you beat me by a notch or two, and you ask God, I want all France? Well, that includes my Paris. 
All right, once again, do, do not the, the French have a say that their country shouldn't be given to somebody else? And what if someone even goes beyond that of, I want, the, I want all continents? All right, that would take France, that would take Paris, that would take everybody. All right, God is not going to give you just anything that you ask for, nor should you expect Him to. He's not a genie that's going to grant you wishes. And he's not morally obligated to give you just whatever you want. He's not. That is childish and it's time to grow up. He's not going to do it. And I did those extremes to show how, how it's just as to, to prove a point. To prove a point. I knew, I knew a, a fella years ago, single. He was hoping to marry a young lady... And it was obvious she had no interest in him at all. And it made him angry. And guess who he was, who he was angry at? He was angry at God. He was angry at God because God did not give him what he wanted. He wanted to marry this particular young lady and she would have none of it. All right, does she get no role in this? Does, does she not? That, that you ask for her and therefore God has got to give her to you? Maybe, maybe what you're asking for is not what you need anyway. Maybe if she doesn't want to have anything to do with you, maybe it's best to move on. All right, it's just not going to work. It's not going to work. You will not have a good marriage. And maybe that's what God wanted for him anyway, was a successful and a happy marriage. Not just that you, you pick her out and wham, she's your bride. All right. That is not the way God works. And why blame him for things when, when it would be absurd for him to give you that? Same fella also had a thing concerning parking spaces. Uh, it gets weird that if, if, I'm not making this up, if God were pleased with you, you would always get the best parking spot. Okay. That's, that's getting weird. All right. No, I can look, I can look at the prophets in the Bible and the righteous in the Bible and say he doesn't work like that. He doesn't work like that at all. Last part of this is it's worth the effort. God is not going to let you down. It's worth the effort. It's worth it to ask, to seek, and to knock. It's worth it. But once you have done it and once you have been supplied, does that mean you stop with asking seeking and knocking. No, you continue on because there's more to learn. There's more to, to grow that the, the, the Christian life is not one that has a ceiling to it and you can't grow any further or has a, a certain point when, when uh, the, the, the furthest extent of it and there's nothing else more to learn. There's nothing else more to gain. You've gained it all. You cannot gain it all. There is more to it. I'll tell you this, every time I'm teaching a book of the Bible, every time, I'll read through the book and I will make my notes and adding, adding, actually adding to notes I've already got. And I'll read the book again and I'll add more notes and read the book again and every single time I read it, I find something new. Every time I read it, I find something deeper. And every time I, well, as, and as I mature, I also find more of things that I didn't realize earlier being taught in that book. I just didn't realize it because I didn't have the right perspective, because I didn't have the right maturity. That in time, in time of learning something far greater than what I had earlier, there is no limit to learning the Bible. 
There's no limit to it. You can commit yourself for the rest of your life to it, which I hope that you do. You will gain from it every time. And there may be parts in it where you will wonder what purpose is this? Well, maybe right now it's of no purpose to you. Or maybe it was something that was vitally important in the past, but all right, now it's a matter of record, of understanding and being able to put some things together, getting in more details in these things. But you will find that the Bible has, you, you ask of it, it will always supply. You ask from the Word of God, it will always give to you and it will be worth it. What does Christ give? Christ gives every, God gives every good and perfect gift. Every spiritual blessing is found through Christ. You're not going to be able to get it any other way. And that's going to require something on our part. That we just, we, we're not, as we have stated, we're not just here to, to, to sit by and, and it's all just going to, to be put into place, something is required out of us. Something, and let's do it. Something is that God desires from us and is required out of us, and we should be willing to do it. We should be. And if we're not, that needs to be corrected. It needs to be corrected. And as Isaiah states, while you have the time, seek God while he can be found. While he's here, while you're still here, seek him. Make the corrections now. Saying that, okay, that's going to be my New Year's resolution, puts it off. You don't have to wait for some certain date to begin to do right. You start today to do right. There's no point. I can't guarantee that any of us will live to see tomorrow, much less live to see the new year. We don't know. Therefore, we make the correction while God has given us another day and another minute. We make the correction. The words are for our learning. That's why we have them. They're not here just as interesting, inspiring sort of stories. They're for our learning and so that we will know how to obey God and obey Him. And we obey Him in faith. That's what we do. To obey the words of God is, in fact, to have faith in God. It's not enough to just think that He is. It's not enough to just... Just know deep down that God exists. Having faith in Him is doing His words. That's it. And those words lead us in understanding what we are to do. We are to repent of our sins. That is to turn away from them. That's a past life, a life I'm ashamed of. Let's move forward. And with that, we confess Faith, that faith, it's a personal conviction. Faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and we are baptized and our sins are forgiven then. And this is believer's baptism and understanding what you're being baptized for is for the remission of sins. Your sins are forgiven. And to be brought into His kingdom, not anything else, brought into His kingdom that exists on this earth and that is the church. Nothing else with every right and privilege of a child of God. And now live conscientiously, learn and live. We ask this morning, if you need to respond to the invitation, if you need the prayers of the congregation, if we can help you in any way, that you come as we stand and sing.